Hey, are you a business owner, entrepreneur, or professional? If so, we want you to apply to be a featured guest on our show. My name is Adam Torres, and I host the Mission Matters series of podcasts. I've recorded over 3,000 episodes, and we are just getting started. How do you know if you'd be a good guest to be on the show? Well, only one way to find out, and that's to apply, but I'm going to let you in on a little secret. We want guests to have a story to tell, guests with a brand, a product, or a service that can benefit my audience of listeners. If this sounds like you, go to missionmatters.com and click on Be Our Guest to Apply. I'd love to talk to you and get to know more about your story. Again, head on over to missionmatters.com and click on Be Our Guest to Apply. All right, now let's get into the show. Hey, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of the Mission Matters Business Podcast, your source for all things business. My name is Adam Torres. You can follow me on Instagram, Ask Adam Torres. Keep up with my book releases, book tour schedule, signing, all that other good stuff. Always love to connect with you there. And as always, if you'd like to apply to become a co-author one of my upcoming books, just head on over to the website, missionmatters.com, and click on Become an Author to Apply. All right, so I have Matt Wilkerson on the line, and he is the co-founder and CEO over at Paragon One. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Adam. So uh, excited to get into today's topic today. So we are going to talk about uh, how we externships are changing the face of inclusive hiring. But before we get into that, um, give us a little bit of an overview of Paragon One, please. Sure. So Paragon One takes company work projects and turns them into learning experiences, basically virtual classroom experiences that we call remote externships. And the benefit of a remote externship is that it allows students to receive the opportunity to get real work experience on their resume while they're in college, but in a more accessible and flexible way. And so internships, which we can go into later, there's a lot of challenges with them in terms of how they scale and and, uh, and reach students. And so this is a way to reach more students. And at the same time, they can get mentorship, which we help provide work feedback, training, assessment, and the chance to get a credential from the company. And the cool thing about it for the companies is that it's super easy for them. They don't have – HR doesn't really have to lift a finger. Uh, we handle all of the technicalities. We – handle the onboarding, the training, and managers from the company, uh, when they engage with projects, they only have to spend one hour a week to engage mm-hmm. with either us or the students, and we, we fit everyone into sort of this classroom experience. So it's kind of a, it's a win-win for both sides, and yeah, we've been uh, running this, uh, this platform, uh, specifically remote externships, for a little over a year, but Paragon One uh, originally started um, a few years ago as a, originally as an on-demand career coaching platform for students. So I, I think, by the way, I think your, um, your, your model and the concepts are extremely interesting. Like what, what kind of, um, what sparked you starting this? Like what took you down this path to where you knew, like, there's a lot of business owners, entrepreneurs, executives out there. And there's, you know, some entrepreneurs that are out there, they're grappling with some ideas that they have. And they're like, ah, is this the direction I want to go? Like, is this the route? Is this what really speaks to me? What inspired you to go further down the line with this business? Yeah, well, I, you know, when I was in college, I uh, wanted to be an engineer initially. Uh, actually, I wanted to go and work in the special effects industry for film. Mm. So like Pixar, Industrial Light and Magic, mm-hmm. and um, went to MIT, uh, had a really great experience, but it, it introduced me to so many other things out there that I thought I could be interested in. I got kind of confused, I think, like most students can be when they're going through uh, through their education, which flies by. By the time I got towards the end, I decided I didn't actually want to be an engineer, but there were a lot of other things I was interested in. Um, long story short, I, I ended up uh, sort of randomly deciding to interview in consulting and banking, uh, like a lot of other young people who are ambitious but uh, don't know what to actually do with their lives. And I landed... Uh, the chance to work at Morgan Stanley in their investment banking division right out of college. This was just before the, uh, the 08 financial crisis back in 2005. Mm. And uh, I basically got tendinitis in my hands from typing so much that, because uh, I was, you know, analyst, I was sort of quote unquote game to my desk. 
uh, wasn't really paying attention to my ergonomic setup or exercising. Mm-hmm. I was kind of stressed out all the time. So it, it showed up in, uh, in, in getting tendonitis and I couldn't type for about nine months. Wow. So I, yeah, I thought at the time I thought, well, that's crazy. I don't know what I would do if I couldn't type for nine months. It's crazy. Wow. And imagine if you're, you're an investment an analyst. Thinking analyst. I mean, you're only <laughs> just type. <laughs> like, oh, your job is to sit there and, and make spreadsheets and, and PowerPoint. Oh, and it's stuff. like, it's like, it's like your kryptonite right there. Jeez. Go ahead. I just, I yeah. just hurt, you just hurt my heart because I'm like, man, it's like if I'm like, I'm a podcaster, but I can't talk for nine months. Wow. Yeah. That's basically. Tough. Yeah. That's tough. So I thought, all right, well, my, my career's over. What am I going to do? Um, and luckily, uh, there was this VP um, that I had in, in our I was in the media telecom group. His name, I remember, was Steve Baker. And he, he had this idea because he, he was bringing the intern class in at this point, the summer interns. And he said, look, the interns are, you know, they're clueless, right? They're, as, as they always are. They come in, they're green, they're clueless. They, they don't know how to do this. They don't know how to do that. And, and nobody has time to teach them. You know, nobody really, I mean, the bankers were super busy. No one had time to sit down and teach people how to do a financial model from beginning to end. No one had time to teach them really how, how do you put together a PowerPoint. You kind of just figured it out, or you got other analysts here and there to maybe help you. And so it was, and then you'd get into situations where the interns would be put in meetings. They didn't know what they were doing. So they needed some help, the interns. And they thought, well, I'm not, I'm not doing anything. So I, uh, you know, I was on workers comp and, uh, so I, I basically took up the opportunity to be useful again and I sat on the interns. I, um, taught them how to be better at, you know, Excel financial modeling and how, you know, three statements fit together of a financial statement and how to do everything around, you know, dotting your I's, crossing your T's, doing your footnotes with presentations. And by the end of that summer, they were, every intern was so good that mm. all of them got return offers into the group because they're rare. Usually they would, I don't know, cut That's maybe half of them. Mm-hmm. So that experience sat with me. Uh, if you could harness the resources of companies in a more effective way to mentor students, to coach them, and then eventually to help them actually get real work experience and just essentially educate them, um, the benefit there would be huge and that that's what should be happening in higher education. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, skipping forward, I, after Morgan Stanley, I worked in VC as an analyst. I started another company before this, co-founded an e-commerce platform called AHA Life. And then, um, yeah, basically got the, the kind of the second inspiration to actually finally start Paragon One came. Um, when I, I'd been doing some consulting work for a, a SAT prep, uh, company that a friend of mine from, from college had started. Um, he actually moved to Shanghai and worked with a lot of international students at the time that were coming over. And I got kind of inspiration from um, kind of the S, like the Princeton Review, Kaplan type models um, for college prep and thought, well, let me apply that to uh, coaching students to get jobs, right? Uh, because that's not career centers that weren't getting the budgets and didn't really have much to offer a lot of students that wanted to go really deep and learn about these fields. So I put together this uh, panel that uh, started off with like 20 professionals. Eventually we got to 800 different professionals that were coaching wow. students on how to interview, how to do their resume, what different, you know, what are they going to look for in different career fields? What's it, what's it like to, to work at some of these companies and, and, and uh, places like finance and tech and marketing um, so that was how we started Paragon One, but we were helping students at the end of our programs, and we would run these programs as three- to six-month accelerators, virtually, mm-hmm. completely online. And at the end, we would try to help our students get internships. And that ended up being almost like the bulk of our time and our focus was to try to help the students land a really great internship because, we, of course, we want them to be successful. We want them to be able to kind of put in practice what they did. And so... Uh, that, that's where the big aha came from because we saw how difficult it is really to get, uh, if you're a student, for instance, that didn't have an internship to begin with and you're just starting from scratch, 
and you're expecting the internship to be the place where you learn, well, most companies, they don't want to actually be the educator, right? <laughs> They're not interested in using their money to, to bring students in to train them and then have them leave, right? They're interested in bringing good students in who either, A, uh, will, will contribute something very quickly and provide high ROI because they already interned in a similar area before, mm-hmm. um, or they, they're, they consider them to be high potential, uh, and maybe, the, and, and to be honest, that usually just means they come from a quote target school and they have yeah. a high GPA, something like that. And so they want to invest in them to, you know, hopefully hire them full time after that maybe junior year summer internship. So that left out, that leaves out a lot of students who are going through their education system and doing, you know, doing what maybe universities asking them to do, right? Studying for tests and doing problem sets and writing essays and trying to get that high GPA. And they're not focused on getting real world experience because maybe their, their school isn't offering it to them. They're not providing a pathway into that. Um, or they, no one told them that, hey, you need to be networking like crazy, right? And building up that network. And by the time they graduate, they don't have that. And they're, they're sort of lost. And it, it's like, oh, if I, had, if I had tried this out earlier, if someone had talked to me, if I'd only known that, maybe it might have made a different decision. And, um, and then they end up going to a company that is, you know, having to train them all over again on basic things, things that you and I take for granted, like showing up on time, mm-hmm. like how you dress, like how you present something, how you communicate, asking questions, um, ambiguity, right? Not everything that you do in real in the real world with work is going to have a right answer that you can just say, hey, did I get the right answer? Like a test. Um, so these are these are experiences that students aren't having and we wanted to, and that's what internships are great at. But again, internships don't scale well because they don't, in, internships require that the company's resources, managers, take the place of the educator, right? During it, like the student be at school, going to a class, learning from professors and teaching assistants. But now they're in a company and the resource for teaching is the company. And so because the company's focus, their number one goal is ROI, right? They have ROI, profitability, like making the best hire. All of those are things they should be focused on. But therefore, they're, they're not going to allocate resources to the students that need the teaching on the real work. So, so that's why internships don't scale very well. And that's why getting to the point here is that that's why we find uh, certain student populations, especially underrepresented, underprivileged student mm-hmm. populations are disproportionately affected because maybe the student, uh, you know, I, I, one of the things I say is a lot of companies like to talk about diversity and then they're like, well, we're going to yeah. go to uh, Ivy, Ivy League, you know, we're going to go diver- recruit diverse students from Ivy League schools. And therefore we've right. got diversity. And it's like, well, no, I mean, what you did was you just recruited a bunch of Ivy League students. Yeah. And that's, you know, a, lot, a lot of different that's... ways to slice it up. Yeah, I get it exactly. completely. It makes sense. And so I, I guess I, uh, the, the, the question this brings up, though, is just like, why do you think, you know, higher education overall isn't, isn't really solving or catering to this problem? Because when you, when you explain it like this, and I'm not claiming to be an education expert, but it just seems obvious. It's like, duh. Yeah, you're right. You just recruited a bunch of, you know, Ivy League students. Um, regardless of how you, how you, you break that up is the same thing as the same population. So why do you think higher education isn't really like kind of addressing this? Yeah. Um, if you, if you go back to just, what higher education was designed for. It's designed to recruit and train and, and mint PhDs mm. for the purpose of researching you know, society's biggest problems. Right? That's, that's what it's for. And so the, the structure of you know, the quote unquote ivory tower is set up to you know, first find those, that raw talent, right? That's what the admissions process is about. And then bring them through the different layers. So it, if you can make it to get your PhD, great. But if you don't make it, 
well, we're going we're gonna to send you out into the, quote, real world, and we're going to give you this piece of paper, a bachelor's degree or a master's degree that says you, you, can, you know, you've learned something, you made it this far, and we think that's what you've learned is valuable, and go tell, go show the world this, and they'll, you know, they should agree that it's valuable, and they'll give you mm-hmm. a job, or you can contribute in some other way. And it, it turns out that no, it's not the case, because that pathway was designed with going after a PhD in mind. Like, the classes you take as an undergrad majoring in something are are designed by the powers that be, which ultimately are designing programs that get you into grad school that, that you know, what are the prerequisites you need to take to do X, Y, and Z. That's, that's what they're thinking about. Mm-hmm. They're not thinking about, well, what what is uh, society? Now, there's there's certain programs out there that do this, and I think, you know, engineering programs tend to be a little more practical, right? But even those, having, you know, having studied computer science and engineering, I took my first programming class was a programming language that no one used. In the real world, it was, it was called uh, Scheme, a variation of List. And I don't think they even teach this anymore at MIT. I think they finally replaced it with like C or C++ or Java. But, mm-hmm. but that's what they were teaching because it was designed by a group of people that were like, well, this is important because of maybe like it will help you uh, become a better computer scientist and researcher. Right. Uh, and so that, that's the problem. That's a fundamental problem. And until uh, there are, you know, uh, forward-leaning institutions that want to build that, as we say, build the bridge with employers, with the workforce, and employers who want to step out and become educators and use their brand, um, tell this, you know, meeting with companies recently and showing how they can use their brand and their resources more effectively to become the educator for the students. And now the students, when they earn credentials or they learn something, they're doing it under that corporate brand. And it's a win-win, right? Because the students, they want to they learn these things. They want to get a chance to do it. Um, and it creates a recruiting funnel for, for these companies as well. Man, this is awesome. Um, and Matt, I, I, just lo- I, love, I love the system. I love what you built. And I love the, the problems that you're addressing here. Um, and I think, and I think it's interesting too, the numbers, just the amount of people that you've had on the mentoring side and otherwise the students. I mean, it's impressive. Like it's not easy to do what you're doing. Um, but that being said, so if somebody is listening to this and they do want to learn more about Paragon and they want to connect, um, final question, two part question. Number one, what are the right types of, uh, organizations and or individuals that are typically a good fit to work with Paragon? Number two, what's the best way for them to connect with you and your team? Yeah, well, we, we work, uh, we have two different models. We have models where we work with companies that want to run their own extinction programs and build their own funnel of students, um, sometimes from their own resume pool or, or outside of that. Um, and so, uh, and, and we work with companies like Facebook, Hewlett Packard, Dolo, Venture Capital Fund, and, and um, a couple dozen different companies we've worked with in the past year. So if a company, it could be someone who's in HR, it could be someone who's a functional leader or head, they can, they can um, reach out to Paragon One and go to our website. There's a form they can fill out under the company's page, or they can just email me. My email is matt, M-A-T-T, at paragonone.com. Separately, we work with schools and institutions that want to run externships as an experiential learning program within their institutions. Uh, and we've been doing that with Case Western, uh, Colorado College, Swarthmore College, Dulwich College, and, and many others. And those institutions can go to our website and go to the institutions page. Or, again, you can also email me at matt at paragon1.com. Fantastic. Well, Matt, really appreciate you coming on the show today and sharing more about your background and why you started um, Paragon, but also um, all the great work that you're doing. And to the audience, as always, thank you for tuning in. Hope you got a lot of value out of this. If you did, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast, uh, leave a review on the Apple iTunes store. And if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, Mission Mad Business, definitely give us a subscribe there, but also leave us some comments on the video. I'd love to know what kind of projects and things that you're working on. And thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you.